Welcome to Media and Monuments, presented by Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Media and Monuments features conversations with industry professionals speaking on a range of topics of interest to screen-based media makers. Welcome everyone to Media and Monuments podcast. I am your host for this episode, Tara Jabari. And today we have Chimdi Ahazier. She's a content creator and creative coach with over 20,000 subscribers on YouTube. Welcome, Chimdi. Thank you for having me. Media and Monuments concentrates on on screen or screen based media and things that are growing and it's not looking like it's ever going to die down or slow down is the idea of content creators or influencers. On top of that, we are going through currently at the time of recording a strike with the WGA and SAG-AFRA. We also wanted to get information out there for our listeners. So it was sort of like a compromise to focus on a little bit more on this new form of creative content and also still have something active because we are on hold respectfully because we are a support of the strike. So I wanted to first ask, how did you start first start with social media for work? Wow. I think it technically it started for work maybe after the pandemic or after the, the initial sort of lockdown exactly. So I quit my job in March of 2021. And at that point, I essentially had my YouTube channel as a source of income, primarily through AdSense um, and a random sponsor here or there. But before that, I'd been on YouTube for a good like four and a half years, just as something that I'd love to do. And I'd been making money from it on the side, but it was truly never enough to really sustain myself. That's awesome. And actually, one of your most popular videos, I think the second most popular video was when you quit your job without a backup plan to be a content creator full time and a creative coach full time. One thing that I noticed, you have been making YouTube for a long, longer period of time because your number one video is even older than that. And it's about how to close your gap tooth with a rubber band. It's so <laughs> yeah. cool. but I didn't watch that one because I don't have a gap tooth. <laughs> Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. It wasn't relevant. <laughs> but it's so interesting to see the different content that you were making. And are you seeing how weird or how interesting it is that it becomes more viewed like the gap tooth and then quitting your job are so popular? But and then when sometimes you think this is going to be really popular and it doesn't really, what's that experience? It's so strange because you really think you can predict what people will like. And consistently, the videos that have gone the most viral on my channel, I never would have thought <laughs> that they would resonate the way they did, in part because it felt so specific to my own experience, which I think speaks to how the things that we maybe are scared to talk about mm -hmm. or are, feel like, yeah, just some fear to really express are the things that people most want to hear because I felt shame around using rubber bands to close my gap. I thought that was like a sign of poverty mm -hmm. and of like not having access to dental care. And I thought it was like ghetto, honestly, but I was like, well, it helped me. And really, whenever I would mention it to people, that was what I did. They would be, their eyes would open so wide and they would be like, you need to make a video about that. So I was like, okay. And then it was this huge thing. And then similarly with quitting my job, I felt I had a lot of belief systems around that being something really irresponsible to mm -hmm. not have a backup plan. And also just, I really do believe in the power of relationships and networking when it comes to your career. So I thought, am I really sabotaging myself by making a video where I'm honest about how hard it was for me to work at that last role when that's the way I've gotten jobs is through my network and through yeah. who I know. So I had a lot of fear with, with many of those videos. My kind of number one video right now was about not smoking marijuana anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a similar thing where I felt a lot of fear and guilt and shame about using substances and things like that. So it's been really strange to try to be like, okay, I think this will hit and then it doesn't at all when this thing that I'm honestly reluctant to share, but I think I should ends up being the thing that like blows my channel up. It is. And what you said was like, you never know what's going to be the hit and what people respond close to. That's been something I've noticed with other influencers that we've spoken to is at some point they're anxiety goes over like, well, why did this get more likes than the other one? What did I do wrong? And what did I do right? And so they have to kind of realize there are some things that are totally out of your control. How do you deal with, like, you're like, I worked really hard on this. And I know as an editor, 
a lot goes into it, the sound, the shots, all that stuff. And then when it doesn't make such a huge hit, or if somebody says something online, how do you take care of yourself? I think what's super duper helpful is having like a spiritual practice and having like inner healing work and inner child work and all these other things. Because if we are to be honest, we could do the traditional nine to five route and not have to deal with some of these emotional ups and downs, or we would deal with a different set of Mm. emotional ups and downs. And so all of us who choose to be online creators, we know what we're getting into to some extent. And that's just part of the territory a little bit, but essentially I have to be okay with creating because I actually want to do it and because I actually have fun and I actually enjoy doing all the editing. And it's when I get caught up thinking like, how is it going to perform when I'm so outcome focused? That's when I get tripped up because then I feel every single cut I make in Premiere Pro and I feel every single setup that I do to get some more B-roll. Like I feel the labor of it because I'm not present in the moment thinking about it. I'm thinking about the views that'll come as a result. So I think being able to just genuinely enjoy what I do. And I was doing it for so long without making a dime and when no one was watching. Mm -hmm. So I have that practice already of knowing it's possible that no one will watch this and no one will care. And if I didn't like doing it, then it really was a waste of time. So at least I can always get something out of having enjoyed the process. One thing that I I'm still working on is the negative response or Mm -hmm. negative comments because this as a human being, we want to be loved. We want to be encouraged. We want to be seen. And so when people either don't see you, like you're clearly just like a cipher for them to work through something Mm -hmm. they're going through and they're just like using you as an object basically, or they like genuinely misinterpret you and then they feel really angry and upset. That is really tough. And then of course, being a black woman, there's also that additional element of massage noir Mm -hmm. and getting racist comments and comments about my femininity and things like that. And those are things that they're the very opposite of why you get into sort of creating online is you want people to be like, you're so pretty and cool and smart and I love you. So to get the opposite of that, you're like, wait, that's not why I'm here. So that's something I'm still working through. But similarly, it's just for me, it's about pouring love on myself, having compassion for myself, knowing that I didn't need to hurt anyone's feelings, knowing that people have their own stuff going on and just knowing that ultimately, like the majority of people are super kind and supportive and lovely and encouraging. And that's like the truth that I can connect to. Yeah, it's interesting. Social media grew when people were doing it personally between their friends and family and you put on an outfit and they'll be like, oh, you look so pretty. And then when you get more outside of your bubble, somebody's, ooh, that is not your color or ooh, you look gross in it. And then, but like you said, I think more times than not, well, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes more times than not, they are actually like, oh, wow, you're so pretty or that's such a great dress or whatever. Where'd you get it and all that stuff. So there's more positivity than negativity, but we like we're human and we sort of get stuck on that negativity. Exactly. And it gives me so much more, like I'm even more in awe of like the superstars in our world because of course they have the fame and the success and the money on a much bigger scale than the average person. But the amount of abuse and hate and cruelty they face online is disproportionately much larger. And I can sense in myself a genuine fear about being bigger and growing my channel because I know that it will be proportional. As I get more love, I'll also get more of that negativity and hate. And I also see that it's, I see how much it really is not actually about the person. So I was like on Instagram, for instance, and someone made some post about like Zendaya, who we all know is gorgeous and talented and great. Somebody was like, she's not even that hot. And I was like, Zendaya? I was like, okay, so we're just talking. We're not, that's when I realized like every single person who's like huge on that level They'll have people who just default have a reaction to them because of their own stuff. And so I know I have to work through that. But like you said, one bad comment compared to 10 positive ones, you will remember the negative. And I have to like intentionally sit myself down and do a process where I like, okay, why did that hurt your feelings, Jimmy? And really let myself release it. Yeah, I'm still working on that. How did you decide that you wanted to get into this industry of content creation? Were you always in media or anything like that? Definitely growing up, I always consumed a lot of media, a lot of TV, a lot of movies. And I really felt the power in my own experience of how when you've got a lot going on in your personal life, being able to escape to the screen, whatever screen it is, it's a lifesaver and it really helps you get through. And it really shows it's a window to a new world and it shows you what's possible. Even if people don't always look like you, this is possible. And then beyond that, 
this didn't just appear out of nowhere. People worked really hard and a lot of different people worked hard to make this a reality. And they did it because they love it. They did it because they really enjoy making a movie, a TV show, writing, all these acting, all these different things. And so I experienced that really early. And then um, when YouTube was still sort of newish, I remember watching videos and I would primarily watch them for hair content. So I wasn't really watching get ready with me's or makeup or like life or I don't know, like comedy skits. I was primarily watching hair tutorials. I was like, I need to know how to do my natural hair. And I would watch these videos and I had an intrinsic understanding that I could do it and I could do it well because I watched so much traditional mm -hmm. media. I could see the way online content could leverage what we see in traditional media to make better edits and better cuts and have better audio and sound and all these different things. And it could be this artistic expression as well. And so that was always in the back of my mind. And I am, I'm very, uh, I have a lot of self-efficacy. So I was like, I can do it. And so I just did the research. I was like, okay, what kind of camera do you get? What kind of audio do you get? And I just practiced and then eventually put out my first video and it got a couple thousand views, which is pretty good for a first yeah. video. And that felt like a sort of thumbs up from the universe saying, yeah, you can do this girl. And then never look back. And that was in 2017. Yeah. Did you, how did you get so many views on your first video or why do you think that happened? Well, I did my research and that it's so interesting because I have really changed my approach. So part of me is, girl, why don't you do that again? But I did my research to see what are the keywords, what are the mm -hmm. topics, what's trending. And I really looked to see where there was a gap in the market. So when I, as a, as someone who consumed hair content, I was looking mm -hmm. for certain things. When I didn't see it, I would then say, oh, okay, mm -hmm. if I make that, I'm probably not the only one searching for that. So a lot of my videos came because no one else was making a video like that. And I was willing to create something because I wanted to grow and because it was something that already matched my interest. I also wasn't afraid of promoting. I think that's something I noticed, especially as a coach working with artists, is that there's already some fear in just putting themselves out there. But then when it comes to blasting all their family and friends with the link saying, hey, watch and support it, texting, there's a little bit of that shyness because there's that fear about what people will say and all that stuff. And I didn't have that. I was like, Facebook, friends, email. Like I was like sending it to everyone. So I think the combination of my own promo mixed with having a video that actually fit a need in the market is what allowed that first one to do. And I could be wrong, but I think YouTube does give you a little bit of a push if it's your first video, but or at no, least at the time that. that you did it. Yeah. Cause that's still that's true. Yeah. so many things have changed since 2017 on algorithms and stuff, but that is very good because I'm constantly asked like, why didn't my YouTube get video? And these are usually like baby boomers or older <laughs> mm. who are experts, like scientists, and they have these videos that they want to share. And they're like, no one's watching. And I'm like, did you share it on your LinkedIn? No. And I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> the first step is like people, you know, will watch mm -hmm. it. You also need to self-promote and don't be ashamed to do it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think there's a real snowball method. It's from, like we said, the algorithm's always changing. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that YouTube will show the video to the people who subscribe to you first. And if they like it and really respond, mm -hmm. then they'll start sharing it wider than that. But if the people in your own network don't care enough to click, they're not yeah. going to then promote exactly. it outside of that. And I think it's, I heard that advice and I do think it's like really resonant, which is if, if you're creating content and your own family and friends aren't interested or don't care, even if it's just like your colleagues who are in the same field as you and they don't find it interesting, it's going to be really hard to go beyond that. So you really need to nail down, like, what is it that makes you a compelling person to watch and makes your videos mm -hmm. compelling to watch before thinking that you're going to blow up? Yeah, that is great advice. You also mentioned that you did research on tools. And that's one of the questions I have is what are some of your favorite tools, editing the camera, that kind of stuff that you wouldn't mind sharing? Yeah. So I actually started using iMovie on my Mac, which was free. It was only after a couple of years that I upgraded to Premiere Pro because I like I was very aspirational. <laughs> I was ambitious. And I was like, this is what the professionals use. So I'm going to use this. But for a while, I really leveraged just the free editing software and it got the job done. And the video that's the biggest one on my channel was made with iMovie. And then I did some research and they said that the Canon, one of the creators I followed was using a Canon C5i and recommended it. So I bought that. I think they're up to like 14 wow. or something. That's like an iPhone 6 or something in terms of in terms of camera equipment, but it's held me down. I think the main thing with cameras too is about it's the lens really. So I use a Sigma 35 millimeter lens and that's held me down. I used to use a separate audio and I would have to like clap my hands to sync it up. What I realized with creating, there's already so much work, especially in the beginning. So anything you can do to reduce the barriers to entry, you definitely want to leverage. So now I use the kind of mic where you just plug it directly into your camera. 
like the directional mic, just from Amazon. I don't think it's anything special. I don't remember the name of it, but that's super helpful. Yeah. And I'd say iMovie is great, but Premiere Pro does allow me to have so many more like options, which is, I really do appreciate that. And one thing that I only got much later in my experience was getting to participate in Adobe's Premiere Pro Mm -hmm. like creator camp, which is specifically to support creators and learning how to use Premiere Pro. And there were just basic things around like organizing my files that I just wasn't doing or just like having a workspace that I used when I logged on. And literally I felt, it was like, it was this incredible anger because I felt the decades of my life (laughs) that I had lost, just the amount of time. It took so long to edit one video. And I was like, if I just had these basic things, I could have saved days of my human, my precious human existence. So I think as much as you can do before you get started in terms of how to set yourself up for success, it goes such a long way. And I, if I could go back in time and tell myself one thing, it would be to just get these like basic things set up. Now your YouTube and like your Instagram, it says you help artists grow their audience and clients and opportunities with consistent and authentic content creation. What does that mean? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So essentially it means like all types of artists. So I've worked with like poets, but I've also worked with like interior designers. I've also worked with like event planners, which might say something about me needing to like audience a little bit more square down. But essentially folks who, in my experience, they have a lot of talent. They have friends and family who see and encourage it, but they have some fear around showing up and showing up in a consistent way. And so a lot of the time, it's really about holding space for them to be with the fear that they have around showing up and then holding them accountable. So it's okay, Monday at noon, we're going to get on a call Mm -hmm. and you are going to go on your Instagram and you're going to make these posts. So for instance, I had an interior design client. She'd been doing it for years. It was her passion. Everyone knew about it. People would DM her asking for advice. Like it was her thing, but she didn't present herself as that. So I was like, okay, we're going to just start by changing your Instagram bio and creating nine posts that are about you interior designing. And we like brainstormed the different topics. And I was like, okay, at this date and time, you're going to make the first post. And that's often what it comes down to is we have these dreams and we have these passions and they feel nebulous and they feel scary and big. But often it's as simple as pick a photo, write this caption. And so having someone just hold you accountable to doing that makes a difference. And so with that client, for instance, within a week, she had someone reaching out to her to pay her for her interior design services because the audience was already there waiting for her to show up. So a lot of it is working with these clients, get specific about their creative strategy and then holding them accountable to actually execute against it. Being held accountable, just like how you're expected to come into the office at nine and leave at five, this is your version of accountability. Did you post? Did you comment? The second question I had was, you say the consistent aspect, but authentic content creation. And I think authenticity is actually quite difficult to find sometimes in real life. Even when I go get like, a coffee or something. They're like, how are you? It's just, it's not an authentic question to ask, right? We just do it. And you're like, great, thanks. you," And all sorts of stuff. And I remember one time the man had an accent and he said, how are you? And I said, no. And he's, oh, you didn't have a good day. (laughs) And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. That's what you write. Actually, I did have a really bad day. Now that you bring it up, I mishired what you said. How are you? He's, oh, I'm so sorry. Actually, my day was bad too. And I'm like, hopefully it'll get better this week. Maybe we got all the bad today. And it became a little bit more authentic and genuine. But it was so funny that I was like, "Uh, what did he say? No. And I was like, oh, this is on com. Now you put it online. There's no real back and forth, not that immediate back and forth. So What Mm -hmm. does it mean to be authentic online and how do you know when you're not doing it? I I really love that story, but I love that story for a few reasons. One, because I think all of life is mirrored in every moment. And so when I hear that story, what I think about is sometimes we do sleepwalk through life a little bit and we also go into experiences expecting it to be a certain way. So I think 
if you go into a coffee shop thinking this person doesn't care about me, they're just doing their job. When they ask me this question, they don't mean it. You're going to give them an energy that matches. I personally walk through life as if everyone is so happy to see me and they can hardly wait to talk to me. And I'm like, hey. And we, so that kind of changes the way I engage with the world. But I think in order to do that, you also need to feel like it's safe for you to do that. That's a really big thing with my clients is that, especially with folks who are non-binary or who identify in other ways that aren't cisgendered, all these different things, is like there is a very legitimate experience in their real life and online of folks being attacked and even losing their lives because of how they identify and how they show up. So it's not just a matter of wanting to put a fun video on the internet. It's like their identity and their very existence is at stake. And in my experience, like in that example, it's that's very obvious. But even in even for every for everyone, there's a certain level of like existential fear that comes with showing up authentically in our friendships and in our family and in our work, as well as online. And so there's just different. It's just a it's a spectrum, but we all have some element of it. And so what I really work with my clients on is about doing that internal work to feel safe in themselves, in their own body. Because if you can't even walk through your work or your family or your relationships and be yourself, of course, you're not going to be yourself online. So first going to, okay, in my everyday, what are some ways that I am dishonoring myself? What are some ways that I am saying yes when I want to be saying no? What are some ways where I actually have a passion and I I don't want to do it because I'm scared someone's going to think a certain way? And not saying you need to go from zero to a hundred, but let's, what's one way you could be a little bit closer to doing this thing that you actually really enjoy. And that process of being really gentle with yourself and being really kind and taking it slow, but then also proving to yourself that when you make these little promises to yourself, okay, I said I was going to, I really want to get into painting. Mm. So I'm going to just go to an arts and crafts store. I'm not even going to buy anything. I'm just going to go to the store and just look around. And even that can be fearful if it's tied to some stuff around What does it mean to express yourself? And maybe your family doesn't approve of you being creative. So just making these little steps and showing, okay, when I make a promise to myself, I keep it. And I thought it was going to be scary, but it actually wasn't. Those things make a huge difference. And that's what I see again and again with my clients is they're like, I was so scared, but I did it. And it wasn't that big of a deal. And they like, it's like a door being opened to their new life where they're like, wow, all this stuff is possible. And it's really cool to be with people at that moment of like realization. That is really well put. Thank you. I also noticed that you did have a podcast yourself, but it hasn't been, you haven't been really doing it or at least no new releases in a while. I just got back. I'm on episode two of the second season. So this is, I just got back into it. No, I, it's been like in the last two weeks. Like I think since you reached (laughs) out and between the time I said for reaching out and us having this conversation, I have since gotten back to it. So what, one of my questions was you're doing Instagram, you do YouTube and the podcasting, and I'm sure many other platforms. How did you decide, oh, what works for me? What didn't? And that kind of thing. Well, what I noticed, it's really interesting to see. And I think anyone who starts something creatively and goes for a while will notice something similar is the stuff that used to take me weeks to do when I first started now take me days. Like it used to take so much emotional, not even thinking about the physical effort, so much emotional effort to be like, set up this camera, talk into it, edit it, put it out. Like that itself was a mountain. And so what I found is that as I got really comfortable doing every kind of creative task. Then I did start looking around. I was like, okay, what's the next challenge? And so that's how it was when I started my podcast, which I started a year ago. But I also was in a particular place in my life where I just moved to New York. I was really lonely. I didn't have a lot of friends. I was having all these experiences. I wanted to process them. And I didn't think they would be helpful, but it basically was my way of kind of talking to my imaginary internet friends and sharing what I was going through. So I did that for a season and then I moved to Mexico and the life changed and I started getting into different things and it became less of a priority. And I started like pouring into my coaching and I started the Instagram for that and this, that, and the third. So what I've really noticed is like, as you do what, anything, if you do, as you do anything more and more, you have more experience and more practice and more capacity, but then simultaneously as you do the emotional work. So basically in the last year and a half, I did a really intense trauma healing program And that process itself like released a lot of fear and a lot of like stuck trauma in my body. So now the same things that 
would have kept me from posting on LinkedIn, for instance, which was like one of those, those mountains in my mm-hmm. mind. Cause I was like, LinkedIn is where the serious business people are. And I'm just a fun YouTube gal. So I had all these limiting beliefs around that. Now that's really easy for me. So I think part of it is how much capacity do you have inside of you, but also externally to do all these different things? Because there's some people who, yeah, they juggle 15 projects mm-hmm. at once, but they have the capacity for it and it doesn't burn them out. Where me from a few years ago, just having a YouTube and Instagram, I was like, I'm overwhelmed. (laughs) I can't do a video every week. I got to go to a video every two weeks. So it really does just change as you grow as an artist. It reminds me of when people are always asking health professionals or what do you call personal trainers and stuff. And they're like, what time is the best time to exercise? Is it before breakfast? Is it after? Is it night night time? And they're like, it's the time that you will do it. Just do it. That's mm-hmm. the number one thing. And it is very similar to how we use digital media. Like if you're going to do it, great. If you cannot, if it's just too much for you, don't do a podcast mm-hmm. or don't post on LinkedIn. But if it's fun and you will actually be on Instagram or on YouTube, go for that. Exactly. So, and it reminds me of a great quote I heard and it stayed with me ever since. And it's this idea that if you have to step out of alignment to get something, you're going to have to stay out of alignment to keep it. So if you're like, okay, let me work on this podcast and then I'll get X, Y, or Z. It's that X, Y, or Z is going to mean that you have to keep making that podcast. <laughs> so you can't even do it now. It's going to be much harder to do it then. And so, yeah, just, I think the emphasis is really just to make sure you enjoy the process and you genuinely, if that's enough for you, because if it isn't, then anything you get as a reward, you won't be able to sustain it. You touched on this briefly when you said, like, when you were thinking of media, Sometimes you don't see yourself, but you still go to media as a form of escape or expressionism. What I'm seeing interviewing people who are influencers and just reaching out and researching it more and more is the diversity and who has a following that you don't see in more traditional media, be it television, film, or even streaming stuff. What has been your experience and why do you think it's popular that a more diverse group, non-binary or different ethnicities, all sorts of stuff get so popular? I really appreciate you naming that because as someone who did love movies and TV growing up, I always wanted to be a part of movies and TV and traditional media. I still want that, but I just assumed because of what I saw that It's already hard, even if you're just like a white male, it's already pretty hard. And I thought it would be doubly hard for me. And so I thought the only way I could even have a chance of getting into traditional media would be through creating my own platforms. That was always in the back of my mind. And there were creators like Donald Glover and of course, Issa Rae, who affirmed, yes, like it may take you 15, 20 years, (laughs) but if you like stick to it and you create your own thing and you're passionate and you're consistent and authentic, eventually you can find your way into these more traditional ways of being seen. And I think what's really beautiful about creating online is that the gates to entry are basically, they don't exist. You have an internet connection. And if you have technology, you have a phone or camera, whatever, you can be putting yourself out there. And then instead of sort of these white men in suits deciding what people are going to watch, the actual audience gets to see. I think what's a little bit tricky is like, there is still a level of what gets, like, there's still a level of censorship in terms of which like opinions get seen and things like that. I think TikTok is really interesting because I think there was some stuff around even the homes of the people had to look a certain way. Yeah. So there's certain things that are still happening, but I think it's just a small fraction or it's just way less than it used to be, which is really beautiful. And I remember I listened to an interview with Gabrielle Union and she talked about working on Bring It On, the dance cheerleader movie and how test audiences loved all the stuff involving like the black dance team so much so that they like created fake scenes to put in the trailer that wasn't actually in the movie because people responded so well. And then what she's experienced as an actress is that studios would try to really lowball her and essentially minimize her impact and her mm-hmm. popularity But having an online platform has really shown Mm -hmm. like, no, 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 I am popular. People really do like me. And so pay me what I'm worth. So it's I think it's really still evolving and it's changed so much just in the last 15, 20 years. And I feel like every year it changes more. And I'm really excited to see what happens as a result of the strike. And I think it's so beautiful that the actors and the writers are in solidarity and they're really standing up for their own rights because 
that is the way that you make sure stories get told and authentic stories get told is by saying, I'm willing to put my livelihood on the line to make sure this happens. I'm not in traditional media yet in that way, but I know their actions Mm -hmm. are going to support me if slash when I eventually do get there. Yeah, this might you might not be able to talk about it, but when we spoke in person a a year or two ago, we were connected because we had traveled with Remote Year and you had shared that it was a privately funded reality series where it was about nomads in Mexico and you didn't really know what was going to come of it. Is there any updates and how was it working in the reality world sphere? So just to clarify, Remote Year is a travel program that, you know, folks can sign up for and do six month, year long Mm -hmm. retreats, all this kinds of stuff. Through that network, I met somebody who was producing a reality show about digital nomads. And so I got to do like this two week experience hanging out in like Mexico and just being real messy Mm -hmm. and pools and just all the stuff that you think happens on reality shows. (laughs) I was living that best life. And it is it's different when you're in it. I must say no updates on that. I haven't heard of anything. I think one thing that's interesting is it's just like anything creative where you have an idea of what it's like before you go into it and then you actually go into it and you realize what it is because I don't think the folks who were creating that show had any existing relationships with producers or like any of these streaming platforms. They were very much that entrepreneurial, let's just make a show. Let's just hire a director, you know, that kind of energy. And all of us who signed up were like, yeah, you know? So I, I think maybe they may have underestimated all of the work that goes into taking something from idea to reality, especially in a reality television market that is super saturated and that you, I feel like you really need a hook that's so interesting in order to have it be online. And I don't know if our hook was enough, given that you have reality shows where it's meet this person in a box and get married in a month. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's insane. <laughs> I'm gonna watch every season of that. It's you know? so wild how people got so into that show and I would watch it and I'm like, I don't get it. But either way, but I also like the Kardashians and people think I'm crazy. There's a little, there's an audience there's for everything. There's something for everyone. Exactly. I want to defend Love is Blind now. The reason why I found it compelling, especially in the beginning, is that you are used to reality shows being fake. Like mm-hmm. you just assume mm-hmm. it's fake. And so for me, it was like, wait, are you for real going to marry this person? Like marriage is not a joke. It's your marriage. It was a shock of you're really going to and I'm like, that's your mama. That's your family. You're going to bring your mama to a fake wedding? It just shocked me. And then they, some of those people actually got married. They're still and married. They're so, yeah. So that's why I personally was very <laughs> compelled by it. Is there anything that we have not touched on that you'd like to uh, speak on about being an online creator and how this is a new form of screen-based media? I think... One thing I'm realizing as I do it, and that is the way life is, you can't learn it (laughs) any other way, is, you know, there are a lot of downsides to being an online creator. And before you experience them yourself, it is easy to write them off. And subtle things like meeting people, Mm -hmm. like it is a default that when you meet a stranger, you don't know them and they don't know you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you get to make a first impression. And I just had the experience where I met someone thinking that was the dynamic. And they mentioned later, by the way, I heard you on this other podcast, did a bunch of research into you, followed you on social media. So I actually already know you. And I'm like, oh, I'm not fake. So it's fine. Like, I'm not like I wasn't putting on an act so that it was I was like a different person. But that's like a pretty subtle thing. Oh, I actually like you. There's this power and balance mm-hmm. a little bit because you already actually know a lot more about me and some really personal things yeah. that I've chosen to share online. And then, of course, as a woman and as a black woman, there are levels of just like basic safety that that I am just like just starting to see like, hmm, I might need to be more careful about this. I was watching an interview with some large streamers and online creators, and one person mentioned one was like a a Twitch streamer. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned there's this thing called swatting where people will call the SWAT team on your house while you are live streaming. And I'm like, what? Like, just, there's like a different word. Yeah. And I'm like, and so I'm just, they do it there's as a lot of fear. Or yeah, but then it's real SWAT people out there with the guns drawn. And I'm like, whoa. And then in general, like the biggest creators from when I was younger, you know, a lot of them, they talk about how they had incredible anxiety mm-hmm. and stress mm-hmm. and depression. And so when they were at the height of their external success, it was when they were at the like lows of their inner mental health. And I'm just like, and that seems to be like 
super consistent. So I'm like actively looking for examples of people who are doing very well professionally and creatively and are also like, and I'm healthy and I am okay. But I wonder if it's like intrinsic, like if you are setting yourself up to want and search and seek for a lot of external validation, does that inherently point to something in you where like you feel like you're not enough? And I'm, I hope that's not true, right. but part of me is wondering. And also just those safety measures. Like I've never heard of the swatting prank. Right. I have Wild. heard of where they are live somewhere and the guy will, a stalker or somebody who just feels like they know you shows up at that place. Oof. So they are a little bit more cautious security wise, safety wise. So it's all sort of an experiment. And like you said, like this is the first time we really are able to share so much of ourselves to such a public, uh, to such a wider audience. We don't really know what it is to have a emotional stability, mental capabilities and safety protocols. It's a bit of an experiment and I'm so glad that we're talking to people who do this for a living because it's only growing and there are mm -hmm. pros and there are cons to all of this. So thank you mm -hmm. so much for coming on. What would you like to say last words? Last thing I was gonna say is there's a lot of talk about how a lot of young people want to be influencers mm -hmm. as their job. And I think what's really interesting is that I think it will just, I think in the same way that kind of everyone has, a, not everyone has an Instagram, but it's pretty common to have an Instagram. I think it'll just shift in that way. We're like in a couple of years, like, oh yeah, my YouTube channel. And like that becomes just like yeah. a normal thing that everyone has. <laughs> so there will always be this expansion of what's normal. And then there will always be like a much smaller percentage of people who take it very seriously and turn that into their career. But I feel like some of the panic around social media is just based on a lot of fear and a lot of it being new. And like every medium from television to movies, to talkies, to the radio, there's always something new. There's always a bit of fear. We figure it out and then it gets disrupted and the cycle continues. Thank you so much again, Chimdi. Um, do you want to just share where people can find you or any resources that you wanted to share? Sure. So on my YouTube, I'm at Chimdi, C-H-I-M-D-I. My coaching is on Instagram. You can do coaching by Chimdi. My podcast is called Voice Notes from Your Friend. And my website is ChimdiHazier.com. So you can just see all of that on my website. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Thank you for listening to Media and Monuments, a service of women in film and video. Please remember to review, rate, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. For more information about WIF, please visit our website at www.wif as in Frank, v as in Victor.org. Media and Monuments is produced by Sandra Abrams, Candace Block, Brandon Ferry, and Tara Jabari, and edited by Emma Klein with audio production and mix by Steve Lack Audio. For more information about our podcast, visit mediaandmonuments.com.